There are several dozen different kinds of wild sheep in the world. They live in a great ark, which resembles their horns, and they're not found outside of it. The ark starts in the Mideast, runs across Asia, then through Siberia, and then down through Alaska and Canada and into the Rocky Mountains, home of the bighorn. Even though they're the forefathers of all domestic sheep, the wild sheep lead a very different life. Following a band of bighorn for a year can tell us a lot about wild animals in general. There's death, birth, and growth. Playful youngsters become wise adults. Life in the wild is also the never-ending search for food and the constant threat from predators. The seasons are all important. In the mountains of the Bighorn, spring and summer are abundant, while winter is barren. Each year, only the strongest survive to carry on the line of the Bighorn. From where I'm sitting, it's 10 miles to the nearest road. Down there is the world of man. But up here, in this high free place, this is the world of the wild sheep. These wild sheep are known as bighorn. Of course, the name refers to the huge horns of the males, the rams. Bighorn sheep are normally very shy and difficult to approach. But after living and working with them for many months, I've gained their trust. I've learned a lot about the bighorn, and I would like to introduce this animal to you. springtime in the Rocky Mountains. Snow melts, flowers bloom, birds sing, and every form of life is renewed. When a female bighorn sheep, or ewe, is ready to give birth, she leaves the herd and finds a secluded, narrow ledge. Here she brings her baby into the world. Weak and wobbly at first, the lamb will soon grow strong and healthy on its mother's milk. Nothing can stop the naturally curious lamb from exploring on its own, even when only a few days old. Even though the hooves of a bighorn sheep are adapted for climbing on rocks, it is still possible for a sheep to get into trouble, especially when that sheep is less than a week old. The lamb finds itself trapped on a narrow ledge. The cliff is straight up and down on all sides. The ewe, far above, can do nothing to help. The lamb has only one choice, 
jump. Once down, it scrambles around the cliff, up through the rocks, and back to its mother. The lamb has learned its lesson. The mountains are unforgiving, and they allow only one mistake. Many bighorn sheep are killed by snow avalanches, rock slides, or just one slip on a narrow mountain ledge. When the lamb is about one week old, the ewe takes it back to the other sheep. The ewes and their lambs band together for mutual protection. Some sleep or graze, while some keep watch for predators. But the lambs are young and know nothing of these dangers and couldn't care less. They're perfectly happy to spend these warm, early summer days romping and playing. This young sheep will never know its father, except during the fall mating season, the ewes and rams live apart. The older rams spend the summer in the highest, most rugged alpine basins. At this altitude, snow remains, at least in patches, throughout the summer. The huge old ram, leader of this band of rams, is the young lamb's father. He watches over the group and they benefit from his years of knowledge. For the bighorn sheep, summer is a time of plenty. After the long winter when food was scarce, they now grow fat again, spending their days grazing and resting in the summer sunshine. Even though the band of rams and the band of ewes and lambs are separate, their habits are similar. This young lamb, its mother, and the other ewes and lambs also move to higher country for the summer. On the journey to their summer pastures, they must climb miles of rough, nearly vertical terrain. Finally in the high country, the lamb sees snow for the first time. And over the course of the summer, it meets the other animals which share its mountain home. The mountain goat closely resembles the bighorn, and bands of sheep and goats are often found together. The sure-footed mountain goat spends its life in the highest, rockiest country it can find. The bighorn live in the grassy meadows between the cliffs and rock outcroppings, but the mountain goat lives up in the cliffs themselves. The sheep also intermingle with mule deer, so named because of their large ears. Male mule deer, the bucks, have branched antlers, and the females, or does, have none. Animals with antlers must shed the old ones and grow a new set each year. Animals with horns, like the bighorn, do not shed them. The young lamb's horn started growing at birth and will continue throughout its entire life. Elk, like this bull, are usually found at lower elevations during the summer. The black bear, too, sometimes roams the high country with the bighorn but normally stays in the forest below timberline. 
moose very rarely climb the mountains, preferring to feed along the rivers and lakes in the valleys. There are lakes in the high country where the bighorns spend the summer, and many kinds of animals and birds live on them, like the Canada goose and the beaver. The young lamb meets all these animals and more. Most are friendly and harmless, but some are to be feared. Predators, like the wolverine. golden eagle. As summer progresses, the lamb meets the smaller mammals too. The marmot, a chubby little animal a lot like the woodchuck, spends all its time eating as much as it can. It must put on a layer of fat which its body can live on as it hibernates through the winter. The tiny pika has a different operation going. The pika gathers grass and lays it in the sun to dry, curing it much like a farmer cures hay. Then it stores the dried grass in its burrow for a winter food supply. Although the marmot sleeps all winter, the pika stays awake. The snowshoe hare has a few tricks of its own. As winter arrives, its fur turns from brown to white, perfectly camouflaging the hare from its enemies. There are several different kinds of ground squirrels in the mountains. The Richardson's ground squirrel, the golden-mantled ground squirrel, and the 13-lined ground squirrel. Chipmunks, common in many areas of America, live here too. Another small animal is nearly as widespread as the chipmunk, but much shyer, the northern pocket gopher. It only comes above ground when pushing out dirt to clean its burrow. The bighorn sheep also live in harmony with many species of birds. The blue grouse, the raven, and the magpie. Throughout the summer, the lamb continues to grow. It starts feeding less on its mother's milk and more on the grasses that will be its adult diet. A change has taken place in the appearance of the lamb's mother and the other ewes. Their hair is now scraggly and multicolored. The sheep are shedding their old winter coats and growing new ones for the coming winter. As summer comes to an end, there is a growing briskness in the early morning air. The sheep sense it and instinctively know that it will not be long until they return to their winter pastures. The snow begins to fall on the mountain peaks, and every morning moves further down, finally reaching the meadows where the bighorn bands have summered. 
they remain a few days longer until they are driven down by the snow. Once again, they travel from the high alpine meadows down to the bare south-facing slopes to spend the winter. They must find an area that will be blown clean of snow by the winter winds. Their only food will be the grass buried under the snow. If the snow becomes too deep, they will not be able to reach the grass. On the way down the mountain, the bands of rams and ewes intermingle, drawn together by the mating season, which is not far away. Even as the bands of sheep reach timberline, there are flurries of snow in the air. On the winter range, the rams and ewes group together after spending the summer apart. Autumn is in the air. By this time, the lamb has grown quite large. It weighs about one half as much as its mother. Before long, it will witness one of the most spectacular events in the animal kingdom, the mating season battles of the bighorn rams. Bighorn rams, but the horns aren't all big. Some are medium, some are small. Their society is based on a hierarchy, and that hierarchy is based on horn size. The one with the largest horns is usually the leader, or dominant ram, and so on down the line. There's a great deal of activity on the mating grounds. Instead of walking casually from place to place, they now run. They're drawn together into groups, and as they huddle, they interact. Now, even the smallest gesture has a meaning. When they twist their heads, it's to show off the size of their horns, and their gentle-looking kicks are invitations to a ritualized contest. These rams, in the prime of life at about six to eight years old, are ready to compete for breeding status. Their horns weigh from 20 to 40 pounds, and each ram can tell at a glance which of the others has larger horns, which has smaller, and most important, which has the same size. The conflict arises when two rams of equal size come together. When a small ram faces a large ram, there is no contest. The small ram realizes he is outmatched and the large ram would not fight him anyway. So generally, the very young and the very old rams do not join in the fighting. But when two rams in their prime face each other, a fight is bound to result. Each ram backs away to get a good running start. Then, as if at a given signal, they charge each other. When the heavy, solid horns collide, the impact can be heard a mile away. The contest may end after several blows, or it may continue for hours. It will continue until one of the fighters is too exhausted or battered for more. Yearling is not welcome now. The contest is only for the prime rams. Evolution has prepared them for these battles with a thick facial hide and a double-layered skull that absorbs the force of impact.
the victor, healthy and strong, wins the right to breed with one or more ewes. After mating season, it's not long until winter arrives. The sheep must paw the snow aside to find the grass they need to live. This is the hardest time of the year for them. For others, it's easier. The weasel, now white in its winter camouflage fur, stays snug and warm in its underground burrow. Above ground, winter is harder. The deer eat the last few leaves from the trees and paw through the snow looking for plants called forbs. The elk too are on survival rations as the snow continues to fall. Unlike the deer and elk, the bighorn is declining rather than increasing in numbers. Lack of adequate winter range is probably the most important factor limiting the bighorn. Until the 19th century, they were found from British Columbia to northern Mexico. From an estimated two million, bighorn populations have dwindled over the past century to about 25,000. Their present range is extremely diminished. They live in widely scattered bands throughout the Rocky Mountains. The young sheep must learn the roots between summer and winter pastures by following their elders. The memory dies out when man interrupts the roots. Man is the reason the bighorn do not have enough room to live. Man with his cattle and his sheep, overgrazing the public lands and giving the bighorn diseases. Man with his guns and plows, Man's inroads into the wilderness have forced the bighorn back into the most rugged areas of the mountains where their only defense is inaccessibility. And here, remote from civilization, the bighorn lives on. At last, springtime arrives. The sheep are no longer dark brown, but almost white, bleached from the winter sun and snow glare. They become itchy, and to shed their long winter hair, scratch themselves on rocks. Not all of the sheep in the band are still alive. Some have been killed by predators, some have been killed by man, others by starvation or avalanches but many have managed to survive. The big ram, leader of the group, is dead. But the ewe he bred the fall before is alive, and when her lamb is born, the cycle will be completed. From one springtime to the next, the wondrous miracle of life springing from life as springtime once again splashes the mountain meadows with color.
Finally, man has come to realize that the bighorn sheep and all these other wild things are his responsibility. They're in our trust, and we now have a choice. We can conserve them wisely or wipe them from the face of the earth. We'll probably see a continual decline of the Rocky Mountain Bighorn in our lifetimes. Even in their remote mountain retreats, they just can't get far enough away from disease, overgrazing, and habitat destruction. There is some good news, though. Transplanting herds into new areas is slowly working in several western states. But our concern is essential. Even though they've survived for millions of years in the past, only we can make certain that there will also be a future for the bighorn. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.